Hi, everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of Beyond the Current Situation. My guest today, Dr. Stephanie Rimka. She is a holistic brain optimization specialist focusing on integrated neurotherapies to identify and also address the root causes of mental illness, learning disorders, and also chronic illness. Uh, she's dedicated over 25 years to learning the best practices in functional medicine from uh, masters in their fields. And Dr. Grimker is actually uh, still, she's active in private one-on-one -on -one practice, and she's teaching online courses, which are fabulous, which I'd like to hear more about. And uh, she's leading healing groups in uh, different retreats. And... Um, uh, let, you know, let's just get started. Just let's get ready for a very powerful download and uh, help me welcome Dr. Stephanie Rimka. Welcome, Stephanie. It's great to have you here. Thank you. It's our lucky number five. I feel lucky, it's totally 100% lucky number five. I won't <laughs> ask your whole background story, but just like eh, quickly in a couple of sentences, is there something specific uh, that maybe led you uh, to this holistic um, practice? Oh, you know, there's a, a, probably a whole lot in there. Um, I'd always planned uh, to be a doctor. So I was kind of a poor kid in Detroit, city of Detroit. And, uh, you know, there's not many things that you hold on to with a, a child decision of how do I get out of the ghetto um, and, you know, pretty much doctor, lawyer, engineer, right? That's what I saw in front of me. It's like, those are your choices pretty much to get me out of there. Um, and I was very aggressive in my academics. I saw every grade as potential dollars coming in. So that's how I approached school. I was a little bit maniacal about it um, because that was my path to get out, needing scholarships and everything like that, right? So as I'm in uh, undergrad, um, getting my bachelor's, I uh, broke my back in a soccer incident. And in a soccer game in an incident. I was in a game and I, I scored, but it was not pretty. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'd actually been getting adjusted from a chiropractor when I was 16 years old. I had a soccer injury, actually. Um, I played more sports than soccer, but that's the one that hurt me the most. Um, and it just, long story short, the, the way I was being handled with traditional medicine in a multitude of ways was just failing me. And through that experience of what my chiropractor did to me, I had massive changes in my emotional and psychological state towards the positive, and I couldn't understand it. And so when I started telling him, why, I asked the question, why am I so much happier when I'm getting adjusted? Because I would just go in for pain and then leave when I was out of pain. I would use him like a Tylenol, like everybody else, most people do, right? And I was a kid, so he dealt with me lovingly. So it was through a very powerful conversation that he had with me about what it was doing in terms of the neurological system of perception coming in, motor response coming out, and how that was affecting my emotions and why it made me feel that way. And I just went, that it just was an instant shift. And I said, oh my God, I have to not go to medical school because I was debating between orthopedic surgery or pediatric psychiatry. Well, I ended up... <laughs> being a chiropractor that specializes in uh, mental health. I, I specialize in schizophrenics and bipolar, and I actually just won uh, Atlanta's People's Choice Awards 2020 for best mental health practice in Atlanta as a chiropractor who does neurofeedback therapy, among a bunch of other things, genetic testing and functional medicine, and beating out psychiatrists and the Amen Clinic. I, I couldn't even believe that, but it's really showing that people are craving a holistic view into structure and function and function function and structure and how it all really goes together and you cannot ignore um, the body the mind the emotional state the trauma i look at all of it i look at uh the energy field. I look at, you know, pranic healing chakras. I look at genetics. I don't see how you can address anything without doing it. Certainly when it comes to uh, psychiatric and other emotional instabilities. Yes. I, I, I so align with this. Yeah. You have no well, that's idea. what happened to me. It's a longer so, story, but I'm sure. Uh, yeah. But no, I, I, I so align with this and, and I don't typically like people to, 
to just take out their old stories all the time. It's like, you know, we're in this moment. So yeah. you just, you answered perfectly. There's many pieces of it, oh, but that's a big part of it. Yes, there are. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And, I, and I'm and i definitely 100% in line with this because even based on my own life experiences and, you know, my awareness to self, if you will, uh, what I found uh, that, uh, you know, optimum health was for me or, or what it required was that integration of, yeah. of these three things. Yeah. How we care for our physical body, uh, how we nurture our spiritual self, and, and, and how well we connect uh, heart with mind, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what are your thoughts on that? It sounds like you're kind of in line with that as well. Because Absolutely. I mean, it's all a part of the proper self-care. You know, people aren't really taught how to love and nurture themselves from a very young age. Um, we're taught a lot of distraction techniques and ignoring techniques and things like that. So, and medicine is about as... Um, partitioned and compartmentalized as you can get. So we kind of, you may have heard these terms before. There's a mechanistic point of view of life and health or a vitalistic point of view in life. And so the, you know, I really get, <laughs> you know, if I'm going to get irritated, I'll get irritated with a concept that vitalists are called alternative therapists, where this has been around at least 5,000 years for most of these practices, Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese, at least 5,000, could even be much longer, but we have 5,000 year old texts, like that's vitalism. Mm. This has been around about a hundred years. And yet this has become the dominant way we do things where we just cut things apart. We see them as very separate systems. Nobody's really talking to each other. The kidney guy doesn't talk to the brain guy, doesn't talk to the heart guy, doesn't talk to the colon guy. You know, different drugs are given and nobody seems to be looking at all of it. Um, and the vitalist, which is what I am, really sees a person as bigger than the sum of just those parts. If there's some type of divine spark also within there, there's something within the field or some energy in addition to all these systems and all these little parts. And perhaps the parts are not just what you say they are. Perhaps the heart is not just a pump that pushes fluids around. That's a really simplistic point of view as to what that um, a powerful thing is really doing and you talk about the heart and the brain being connecting like it's a critical thing this is it's so, it's so critical what we know and i do a training called biofeedback in the office looking at heart rate variability and we control the heart rate through breath through emotion and through breathing we can control a factor called coherence that we can measure and track which affects brainwave states right mm -hmm. so people just don't understand because they aren't taught because their physicians aren't tracking this and they aren't telling them and it's a simple technology that costs somebody about 150 dollars and they can do it at home for 10 minutes a day and they're going to have tremendous cardiac outcomes from doing that but why isn't their cardiologist telling them yeah. right so that to be yeah. said i'm a yes. vitalist Love that. Along with acupuncturists and Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic physicians, right? Um, you know, osteopaths are kind of getting swallowed and devoured by traditional medicine. So some of them are vitalists and some are not, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there's, that's, it's, it's trying to take, I try to take all the benefits of, of modern science and technology and things we use a biohack and different devices and machines and biometric tracking ways we can do things and couple them with really ancient primal ways that we've been healing for thousands of years as well as looking how um, our ancestors 40, 50,000, 100,000 years ago used to do things. What was, what was normal human physiology before we um, perverted it with modern lifestyle and so and how do we attain that level with this modern lifestyle that yes. um has perverted us and our, our connection to nature so there's a lot about primal connection to nature which automatically puts your body in the harmony you don't have to think about it your body knows exactly what to do if you give it the right environment to do it unfortunately we're running out of the right environment on earth at this point okay. completely 100 percent. and I, this is really and um, this is really, I think, the way, this is really the way of the world if we want to really stay healthy and just really, you know, live life longevity is, is, is this way. And I think that many years ago, uh, I might be dating myself, but many years ago, it used to be called 
Eastern medicine meets Western medicine. Yeah. Is that yeah. okay? Because I, I'm they older say than that. I, I don't know. Sure. I don't think it's said too much anymore. It probably does. Um, Do you know who got me on that kick first? Pardon me? Andrew Weil. Oh, yeah. 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 Dr. Andrew Weil. I started, you know, picking up his books. and uh, It's a popular I, one. Yeah. Yeah. And that was like back in uh, the 80s. Yeah. 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 There were a lot of, um, you know, pioneer... Um, and it's tough. I'll tell you, you, you have people who've been the salmon against the stream for a really long time. And then when a, tra a traditionalist, a physician comes over to our side and they start talking about it. And now everybody thinks it's some new thing. I'm like, he's not saying anything everybody else hasn't been saying for 5,000 years. I know. It, but okay. You know, <laughs> it's so true. It's like, <laughs> but it's he's like an MD and clearly they're the only ones who know anything. They've only been around for a hundred years, but Okay, mm -hmm. and not to say I'm I'm I sound like maybe sound like I'm bad nothing. I work with a tremendous amount of physicians in practice. We work together. I can't do everything. I don't want to do everything. You need a team, um, mm -hmm. and I work with very specific trauma specialists that help me with the emotional aspects with some very specific dissociation disorders I deal with. I work on the part that I work on, and we work with a functional medicine and our sometimes psychiatrists where we can help modify and titrate medications. You know, I have my role and they have their role, but when we work together, everybody knows what's going on and everybody's doing what's in the best interest of that person. That doesn't go on in traditional healthcare right now at all. At all. And you know what? That's a holistic it's, it's approach. It's a huge isn't it? difference. Yeah. That's a whole holistic approach though, like right. a 360 degree holistic approach to 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 helping people heal is right. exactly what you're doing. Right. But here's the thing. You can't do that in 10 minutes for a $15 copay. It, we not. can't do it that way. It just doesn't, you, you can't even, the physician, any doctor cannot take in that much information, really try to, you know, you are not a set of labs. You are not a couple highlights that happened in your life. It takes a long time to get to know you, to get to know what we're really looking at, to get to look at all the numbers, and then talk with each other and say, well, this is what I'm thinking from my lens. You know, I have a, a, a professional and clinical lens that's based upon brain function. It's based upon neurofeedback, based upon QEG, brain maps and labs. And it's based upon, I don't believe in the normal lab standards that medicine has come up with. I believe there's an, an optimal range that they're ignoring and they let people get pathologized and I move towards optimum. That's my lens. I have a filter of trauma and understanding um, that with patients and I work on that. So that's my lens. So when I talk to a hormone specialist, they have a different lens. I know about hormones. I deal with that too, but I'm like, they're going to see a pattern different than me. When I talk to a geneticist working on the case, they talk about it in a different way. So I deal with epigenetics, but they look at it. So when we all come at it with our, our professional filter, we really can come together in a non-competitive way, with no ego, with the with the patient's best interest at heart, and it's a really beautiful thing. And I found that anybody who's in any type of integrative functional field, you know, we've all had to spend all this time and money out of our own pocket and our own life to do this. That everybody is happy to say, "Wow, I didn't think of it that way." Yeah, why don't you do your plan? Let's try what you just said for a while and see what they what happens. That that's the kind of conversations I have with the docs, and we're like, "This is what I think. What did you see? What did you want to do?" Yeah, actually, go with that plan. Let's see what happens in a month, and that's what patients deserve. And that is not what they're getting. You have a very small select handful of people who are in a uh, a position of um, privilege because they have access to the information. You know, they had education of some sort. They knew the right people and they have the financial resources. And I'm doing everything I can to try and stop that from happening, uh, you know, my private one-on-one, -on -one, like I said, we can't do that for $10 copay. I've never even taken health insurance in 20 years because I don't want to play that game with the health insurance dictating to me what I'm going to do to a patient. I'm not playing that. I, I take my hat off to that. Yeah, it's. I, also, I, I'm so relieved to hear you say that. I know no, I don't it's not any, easy. And you never have. And you'll find the best people won't. And it's interesting because you have old school people like my mom who say that freaked her out. Of course like, it did. Like, of course it did. It make, it's just, it makes me feel like it sounds like you're not legitimate. I'm like, oh, that's it. Right. So to her, you have a license, you take insurance. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but like, that's oh, the way you know, that's they pay me cash. 
then I'll, I don't play that game. I'm yeah. not I'm not in a relationship with an insurance company. Yeah. Um, I don't want to have one with my own, to be honest. And I look at that, it's only trauma care because I don't even use my health insurance on myself. Yeah. I pay cash at all my practitioners basically because they don't pay, you know, for wellness or prevention or optimal. Um, they don't they don't do that. And yeah. I, I hope to change that. I hope if every doctor that keeps trying to come up with this, so it's why I do some of really affordable courses to try and teach people to simply empower them the way you've become empowered. Most of us had to kind of get sick or have a sick child or a sick parent and we've been fighting the system and they've been doing it alone. And you, that's why you have a legion of like autism warrior parents, right? You have, you have these communities, these subcultures that have been created based upon their need to fight, to get basic care, basic reimbursement, basic support, basic, somebody even believe them about what's happened in the, in the system from, from something. Right. Yeah. And, and the more we can educate everybody, they can be more empowered and have really, really full medical consent, full disclosure. So they can make decisions. I'm like, you guys, you can make whatever decisions you want, but you should have all the information and not be being sold a lie. Like yeah. that's what really matters. Right. Yeah. Yeah, totally, hundred percent. I, I I couldn't agree more, and I'm glad that you know I'm glad that this subject came up came up actually. Um, and speaking of empowering, um, you know I do a lot of empowering, but I also do you know a lot of um, of just real, um, real legit coaching, whether it's you know personal or relationally or um, business whatever that is, but what to ask a question because many times it, it, there's a lot of things that come up and then we wind up spinning into doing like a Reiki session because I do, because I'm a master Reiki because I do energy healing. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to ask you uh, is as a holistic um, brain optimization specialist, um, and I know that you work on, I, I think you're specializing in these three areas and correct me, you know, if, if, if I'm, if I'm wrong, but those three pillars where there's either learning disorders or uh, mental illness or even chronic illness. So what I was curious to know was um, what, if any, common denominator do they all, do they all have, if any, as huh. far as the root cause, if any. Mm -hmm. And because, um, because I'm a life, as a life coach, uh, I, I, I couldn't help but wonder or be curious if emotional well-being uh, plays a role in any of these, if not all. Uh, the mind is what wounds and heals the body entirely. So emotional trauma, unresolved con conflicts is absolutely at the cause of almost all of it. Yeah. So every autoimmune diagnosis is based upon an emotional problem, emotional unresolved, some type of... Um, it doesn't mean if something's happened to you, if you've had trauma, just because you have trauma doesn't mean you're going to have a problem, right? It just means it's this unresolved stuckness that kind of happens and how, and again, it's why dealing with this physical reality of the somatic body matters. It's why so many of these somatic healing modalities are really important. It's why just blah, 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 talking with a therapist, as much as I love that, and I refer every day and all day, and they refer to me every day and all day, they understand, the ones that work with me, it can't just be that, because actually sometimes the repetitive talking alone just keeps engraving, ingraining it neurologically and makes it bigger. We oh. have to clear that out of the body. Trauma, emotions are locked in the body. They are chemicals. Um, you know, it's Candace Pert, PhD, Molecules of Emotion is probably one of my favorite books of all time. She's one of the mm. greatest researchers that ever lived. Um, she's no longer with us. She's the person that discovered neurotransmitters. I think everybody should know that name. You know no what serotonin is because she discovered all of it. And she worked for the National Institutes of Health. Her books are amazing writing about this. And she writes it from a woman's perspective with a very holistic way of looking at things because women, that's what we can do. We can look at things in a much bigger way. That's just neurological fact. It's not, it's just what we are really good at, right? We get a bigger corpus callosum, we integrate better, just, you know, no shame into the men, right? But so she writes about it in such a beautiful way that helps get you on a, a starting point towards this journey. But um, the emerging field, which she created was psychoneuroimmunology, right? So you're looking at psychology, 
neurology and immunology, they are intimately connected. That is primarily what I do in practice. Even though I'm not a psychoneuroimmunologist, I'm actually interviewing one tomorrow morning, right? Because this is this is what you do with neurofeedback. If I'm going to be measuring brainwave states, I'm be looking at what the function and structure of a brain is. I'm measuring neurotransmitters levels. I'm looking at hormone levels with panels and I'm adjusting, you know, you have to understand what inflammation in the gut is doing to inflammation in the brain. You have to see how it all works together. But at the core of that is typically, I'm going to find these unresolved emotions almost consistently. Certain disease patterns, we know what that is. This pattern is that. I just actually went to a conference on it probably two months ago, and that was the entire thing about emotions and how they cause wounds. They, they control your immune response. You know, you want to make somebody really sick, shame the living shit out of them. I, 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 I totally agree. Take a child and you shame them. You take an adult, you shame her. You take an old person, shame that shit out of them. They're going to get sick mm-hmm. because you've just destroyed. It goes so far beyond cortisol. What people talk about that hormone. We have all the immunoglobulins and all the, there's many, many inflammatory response chemicals that gets released. The body sees shame as if you're punching it in the face. And it releases an inflammatory response as strong as if somebody physically traumatized you. It is Mm -hmm. the most violent and aggressive thing emotionally you can do to yourself or someone else. Yeah. So knowing that, you can also use these antidotes. So it's what of emotions to heal them. So it's why talk therapy was really good. Yeah, I don't think they're all the same. Really good trained therapists who have very specific techniques that are clinically proven to work towards that pathology. You know, if you have OCD, you need to see this type of therapist. If you have a personality disorder, you need to see a different type of therapist. You have a relationship issue, you see a different type of therapist. Every Mm -hmm. type of therapy is not the same. And and people who fail at therapy, it's often because they're seeing the wrong, like that's not who you should have been talking to because that's not what they do. It's a different, they're very different techniques for different um, lack of integration of emotions. Uh, And you need to be able to have you know, the food helps balance some of these emotions that makes it easier to, to, to do the work, right? So we want to stabilize, you want a stable brain, stable neurology, stable chemistry. So it makes it easier to have your body and your brain and your emotional state flow towards a peaceful way, not, not trying to, you know, like you're trying to use therapy or affirmations while you're in a a typhoon of emotions. If you're eating like crap, you know, junk food and sugar and poisons, it's going to be a whole lot harder to stabilize you, you know, but it's why energy work of all kinds of sorts matter. Breath work matters. Movement modalities matter. Body work matters. It all has ways of tapping in and finding um, a lock and key access to that uh, imbalanced, unresolved emotion that's been stuck. I do a whole series in my uh, one of my courses, in my three-hour course for women, and I call it the Prisoner of Your Neurology series. I think it's four, four videos where I do three videos about the Prisoner of Your Neurology, and I explain emotions and neurotransmitters and how it locked that pattern from trauma gets locked in, like why some women are not getting the weight loss results they want. And I Related to trauma, and like let's talk about that. And then the fourth video is an interview with a DBT therapist that I work with locally that's a trauma expert. We just kind of have a professional conversation that people get to eavesdrop in as to why some of the women that have more weight resistance, despite doing everything right, because they're thinking it's all about just food and exercise, and they never want to distract themselves with that because they never really want to relate the rape at five years old to why they're 300 pounds today. Yeah. You know, know? I love that. I I, I do. And you know, one of the things actually, uh, I don't know if you know, but my, I was nicknamed by actually a radio host, Blocksmith to the heart. I read on your thing. I thought it was really cool. I didn't know. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful. Yeah. Because, because that kind of my, my approach was always, even if I was, let's say I was career coaching someone, it always wound up, uh, being such truth that the the whatever was whatever is blocking you from really reaching like your highest potential or or your highest performance in anything, there's always something that's just like stuck, like you know. The, so so really unlocking 
you know, uh -huh. those blockages. And so it was hence locksmith to the heart. So, and I really love that you talk about that because, you know, Look, emotional, people talk about emotional baggage, that word is so trendy, you know, for 10, 20 years, but really it's energy that's blocking yeah. us. It's, it's, yeah. it's energy. And, um, you know, another thing I wanted to ask you, because, you know, even ultimately, even with coaching, you know, I wind up leading clients to a, into a healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, even if that's not why they first came to me. But um, and this includes the understanding of fresh air and, uh, you know, what you know how we breathe and what we're breathing in and the water we drink the food we eat um the quality of sleep um what what are your thoughts on all of these i'm assuming well i have a whole like foundations of health that i go over with people that i'm like i, I kind of give this analogy that um you know the human brain is fascinating and we're so smart we like to really sometimes outsmart ourselves and make things sometimes way more complicated than they really need to be and i liken it to building a house i've renovated houses and i think it's fun but a lot of people understand maybe a house that there's a foundation you know the contractors have to lay a really good foundation and they build a frame and they build out the rooms and then you build on the second story right there's a natural progression if the foundation is not good the whole house can can lean one way or something could fall apart or there won't be stability you won't have that a lot of times some of your clients i'm sure go through this a lot of my patients do it they're asking me questions about the third story bathroom mirror they want to know they want to pick out the mirror and what that means is like they want to know about which b vitamins to take okay because they're tired well, shouldn't I take B vitamins in? Or I had a lab and it said cholesterol. So I read this. So shouldn't I take this pill? Um, what? And so I go take back <laughs> the basics. Where I'm like, we need to talk about air, water, sleep, movement, sunlight, right? We yes. There's a foundation for health that none of this matters if you're doing this. I don't care. You cannot out supplement not sleeping. You, you can't do it and you're delusional and I will not sell somebody a bunch of pills or lotions or creams and let them think that's going to do anything to compensate for the fact that they sleep three hours a night. That's a complete lie. And if any doctor is doing that, they should lose their license. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants, it's not sexy to talk about sleep. It's not sexy to talk about light. It's not sexy to talk about air and water quality. Because most of this at the end of the day is pretty damn free for you once I teach you what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not gonna make a ton of money on that. Okay? Yes. It's not. Now I could make it, I could run five thousand dollars on labs if I wanted and find some weird thing way over here. Oh, you're deficient in four things. So take these really like maybe they just, you know, like so I you you have to have a good foundation. You start mm -hmm. there. And most of the time you you do that, a lot of these things will self-correct themselves. And so we start with that. It, it's critical. It's it's an important thing. And sleep is one of the primary things I address. We, you, know, you can't do a whole lot of healing if you aren't sleeping. You know, you talk about that you work on a lot of the heart, the locksmith of the heart. It's beautiful, right? It's a beautiful analogy. And this is a key to a lot happening. But in the end of the day, this doesn't matter if somebody doesn't have the first level of safety handled, right? So you can't address this if we don't have housing, food, you know, think basics of safety, no one's life feels in, in danger. So we run through these different parts of the body, different, which have different systems, whether we're dealing with safety and that's our feet and our legs and our sexual organs, whether we're feeling about it's, it's, it's power, it's love, it's expression coming from the throat. So you work your way up from the bottom on, on different layers of empowerment. And, you know, in psych, you know, psychological terms, we would have a hierarchy of needs that we talk about. So you can't talk about philosophy with somebody if they don't have food. You're not going to have a philosophical dissertation. You're not going to ask that person to raise their consciousness. They're starving. They're homeless. Let's deal with safety first, right? You can't talk about love and connection if they're still hungry. So, but then you, they certainly can't have transcendental expansion of their consciousness 
if their if their heart is locked down. They certainly don't know how to express themselves and communicate honestly with their loved one if they're, if they're still clamped here because there's no energy moving here. So it's all part of a system and a flow that mm-hmm. you know you have to make sense with. So yeah. I'm big in my courses. I teach in my master's course. I go over water, air, uh, sunlight at at a atomic level. I go into physics. I go into electromagnetic medicine. Um, I get into the physics behind a lot of what people don't understand about their body. You are an electrical being before anything. That chemistry comes from your electricity, but most of you don't. Yes. Not, you're not sure you know that or not, right? Yeah. We are electricity. And that creates magnetic pulses, right? That's who you really are. And it actually makes you a sound wave being of light. Most people don't understand that. They don't want to think, I'm like, all those glowing images and halos and all this spiritual stuff, that's real. Mm -hmm. You just can't see it. Yeah. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean somebody else next to you doesn't. Maybe see it. You'll notice really enlightened, like open people, people who've been given Shakti pod or other things like that. Babies can't stop staring at them in public because they see the glowing. They see the and glowing. It's, and it's from raising. We get, we get that killed off, most of us, over time. Like that's not real. And to fit in a culture, you know, and not feel like you have a mental illness, you don't want to see those things. Yeah. Right? And, and it's, and it's an growing. interesting thing. Sometimes yeah. with some of my patients, I have questioned. I'm like, huh, it, are they schizophrenic or are they just really tuned in? Like, hmm. I talk about that in my book, Truth to Triumph. I make an analogy between that and schizophrenia. I just can't believe you said that. That's so- Sometimes, you know, I've been to many powerful sp- spiritual healers that have worked on me and you leave and you're like, either she's a genius or she is fat shit crazy. I don't know, <laughs> but I paid her money. And I'm going to go with, she's a genius, but she talks to a lot of people and a lot of things. Yeah, that's so funny. And they make it work. You know what I mean? So I don't know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, remember the movie, A Beautiful Mind, the book about the Mm -hmm. the mathematician and how, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. There's a lot here in the ether. So anyway, Mm -hmm. yes, air, water, light, uh, sleep, it's critical. I go over Mm -hmm. that with all my patients. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes you to teach them breath work. Nobody likes you to go through sleep protocol. I make them all go through a 30 day sleep protocol hygiene with me, but it's important. It's, it's critical. It's and critical. you know what? It, it's fascinating that I can give like a solution and it's going to cost the person $50. I could give another solution that's going to cost you 3000 because there's a higher value exchange on the big dollar. The mind attaches to this is going to work. They think sometimes the simple things that are free are not going to work. And, and it's a tough thing to try and figure that out in practice. But at the end of the day, there is no amount of technology that is going to replace Mother Nature. And the earth and her water and her air and her sunlight and her rhythms and her movement is what's going to keep all of us in sync. It's what's in putting your heart in sync. It's in training your brainwave into its frequencies. And if you are connected to it, everything feels very different. And we're becoming more and more disconnected. And we're seeing more and more evidence of disconnection and disarray and chaos um, because humans have left, you know, their natural connection of understanding nature. We actually have learned to dis- make, to, to be disgusted by it. We're, we're, we're over sanitizing now to a point I'm terrified watching where the human species may be heading, may be taking themselves into a such a severe artificial uh robotic implantation like it's it's yes, happening I agree. for our eyes and i agree it's, it's yeah concerning it is concerning not to mention the lack of um uh, uh like the immune system just breaking down uh, everyone huh. walking around with masks and gloves huh. and everyone well, talk about so shame and, uh, that will just that's the most powerful thing but shame, shame. is another form of fear mm-hmm. right so these 100%. are going on so strong you are having a constant flooding of the body of fight or flight responses. Mm -hmm. The body is not designed to do that. It is designed to be like, there's a lion, I'm either gonna get away or I'm not. So I'm either afraid for 30 to 60 seconds or I'm dead. You're not really in that much pain for that long. It's pretty fast, okay? Mm -hmm. You either get away, a tribe comes to you, you're gonna kill them or they're gonna kill you pretty quickly. 
You know, this doesn't go on for hours. This is not how the human body is actually designed. Cortisol and these inflammatory responses keep you alive. They're genius. They're powerful. They make you strong. They're why women can lift a car off their child magically and be like, I don't know what just happened. Yeah, it's called chemicals. It's, yes, it's called chemicals. can do chemicals. some bad stuff with our body. Yeah. Now, if you have that same feeling and response just going to the grocery store, that's a problem. If you have that for eight hours a day, 12 hours a day, even two hours a day, it was designed for 30 to 60 seconds. The chemical should have been burnt out of your body physically from some physical movement, from a run, a fight, or, you know, like there should, or, or death. It should be done. Well, we live in that state chronically, on and on and on. It's, it's tearing people apart. And they, they just, we become really desensitized to pain and misery and a low level of health. We think it's normal. Um, and so it was like, well, that's just, everybody's stress. So stress is normal. Really? Yeah. Really? Really? Cause really? I'm pretty sure if you drop yourself into a tribe of Aboriginal people right now, they're not stressed out. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, you could just look at the birds outside or the flowers. Yeah. I think they yeah. And we have all the studies. Elements. We have anthropologists that have done this. We have great records from Weston A. Price and other people who went and, visited all the Aboriginal tribes and they didn't live in a state of um, chronic stress, fear, fear stress. mental things that were just imaginary things that might happen. You know, it was either it happens or it, it's either there or it's not. They yeah. You're, you're stressing over something that is, is, hasn't happened. So really yeah. you're just, you're uh, upset about an illusion Yeah, and you're putting all of your energy and, and letting that, empower you you're letting something that isn't really there empower you i mean how ridiculous we're powerful manifestors we are manifesting all the time if a lot of people are doing it unconsciously and under no control yeah that's the problem that's that's where it gets scary that's <laughs> you have to be taught i mean it's why visualization is a key component to my courses oh, i, I love people it. how mm -hmm. to do it you have to do it i make them do it every day <laughs> But I teach them neurologically why. So I get it to the point, I think, where they finally go, I can't believe I haven't been doing this. And I, I was a victim to it, too. You've been hearing, you know, like, but when you understand it, what it's doing neurologically, how it's changing the reticular activating system of your brain, how it's changing your filter of perception, how it really changes your reality, it changes lots of things physically, then how it's changing things energetically. It's, it becomes, I'm very clear with them. I say, if you are not doing this, if you don't love yourself enough for three to five minutes a day to do this, you are clearly making a choice and telling the universe, I want a hard, painful life. Then that's up to you. If that's you are wanting to have a hard, painful life, I can be of no help to you. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And if you're taking those three or four or five minutes and you don't really have, you don't really know what it is that you want, like, you don't have that vision. Like you need to be crystal clear. It's we, easy. We, we start. Yeah. Yes. We start with baby steps. You know what I'm saying? Not everybody has a huge. They go. It's okay. Like tiny vision. We start with anything, right? Yeah. Some people. I know my why. I have my big things. I've been at this a long time. But I'm like, okay. It, it sometimes it's like they'll say, well, what is it you want right now? They're like, I would love to have the money to to put a new garden in my my backyard. Great visualize it's done and you're out there enjoying it for three minutes every morning. Yeah. Just and do what's that. in your garden? What is in your garden? Yeah, every, and then what they start to more and more and it go cut out pictures, play with it. You know, like, <laughs> so they start to like, Oh, I'm like, find pictures on the internet, find magazines, go to the nursery near you. Look at what you want. Take and like make a board, look at the board, close your eyes and do it for three minutes. You know, you the song. So I teach them <laughs> like start there, and as they as you practice, and again, what what you practice grows, right? That is true of everything, but just from a straight brain pattern, functional network, neurological basis, what you practice grows. You practice optimism, you're going to be a badass when it comes to being optimistic. You practice being negative, well, you're real good at it. Good for you. Yeah, right? of course, we can and, master and something you that's have not good. To practice. So if you look at something, you say, God, I wish I was like that. You can be, you have to practice and you just start a little bit and you just redirect that mind to look at this. And, you know, I have post-it notes all over my house with affirmations. Like I have, you know, like you just, you're working on something like, wow, that's a thing. That's really kind of holding me back. It's everywhere. They're on every door, every mirror. I put post-it notes on what I'm working on for that week or that month. And every time you see it, you just read it. It's as simple as that. It's Some as people simple think it as has that. to be complicated. Put post-it notes. 
It's so put an alarm on your phone every hour. Write down or say those three affirmations of the new thing. Yeah. I am healthy, fit, and strong. I have, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have more money in my future than I have today. Whatever it is you're working on that's stressing you up, my children are safe and, and living their best lives. You know, like that's whatever. Amazing. So you have to turn it over to repetition to change what's happening in your brain, and then your brain sees that. So it's a, it's a it's an interesting concept of visualization that people don't understand how powerful it is. And yeah. I get it because I resisted it as well. I paid, mm -hmm. I hired people, I went to mm -hmm. courses and paid mentors. And when you hear the same thing finally said, you go, okay, if one more person tells me I need to go home and visualize, I really, and it was, for me, it was all about clarity. I knew how to visualize. I wasn't trusting myself to be specific enough. So some people just need to start like and start anywhere. anywhere. And, I, and I'm like, yay, that you started, right? Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of resources all over YouTube. You're a resource. I'm a resource, right? We can teach mm -hmm. you how to do this. Um, and, the, and it's a process, right? Yeah. You grow with it. You know, when I started meditating, it's different than 20 years ago. I do it differently today. And I have the rhythm that works for me. I like malas. I like chanting. I like Sanskrit. It's what I like. I make a suggestion because and it, it's a form that works for very busy minds like mine. You know, focus concentration meditation works really well for really cognitive, active people. <laughs> it gives it gives us something to do, right? And then we can <laughs> drop down. Um, yeah. So people don't want to do it right. So, oh, trust me. If you do this, you can. Hand, you got a rosary. Do that. You know, like whatever. And it just you know some people works for you. Forms. That's okay. You know that's why there's so many options, and you play with it, and you decide yeah. what you like and what works for you. And what works for you today might not be the thing that works for you five years from now. And that's a good thing, right? People need yes. to be okay with that. You grow. I'm not doing the same thing I did when I was 20. You just took the words out of my mouth. I can't. I could not agree with you more. Because Which we good. go through different. <laughs> yeah, because we go through different cycles yeah. in our life. And that's beautiful. It's a universal cycle. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Like something was good for you when you were three. Yeah. It's not good for you when you were 10. Right. It's, you know. And that's actually what a lot of what the emotions, bringing the emotions and emotional healing is the reality. What I'm sure you've seen with your clients is that many people are making decisions from when they were three and seven and 15. Right. And I have to tell people, I'm like, should you really be making that financial decision at 50 based upon a decision you made when you were dead, mad at your dad at 13? Because that's what you're doing right now. Yeah. So if you don't heal these moments, you get stuck. Mm -hmm. And you're making decisions based upon a child. Mm -hmm. Most of us, you know, the unconscious scripts are given to us by the time we're two years old. One and a half to two years old, you have all your scripts on life. Your family scripts are given to you. This is social psychology 101. You just absorb from your family dynamic decisions about men, women, yourself, the world. This is how it is. Absolutely. Now, you can change those things through different things that happen, but a lot of people don't realize these were given to you by your parents. Some of these decisions you made yourself, but many of them were just given to you. You've just been doing the same thing your family's been doing for a very long time. And then you had things happen and you made decisions and you make decisions based upon a child. Like that's, yeah. that's what I described what I was going to do for a living. I made a decision as a child. Like mm -hmm. doctors are, doctors are respected. Doctors make money. I will become a doctor to bring respect and money to my family. And there you go. Now, and is yeah. it what I was supposed to do? I think so. Yeah, of but, course. You know what I mean? Like, I do know what you mean. I a hundred percent. And it's funny how we even came across meeting each other because um, I, I heard you talking about uh, skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle. Yeah. Let's, yeah. it's a huge deal, right? And, and it's one it's of a the huge reasons, deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal, yeah. It's, it's a huge deal. I, I, you know, it's interesting because I wasn't taught about muscle in this way. And I'll give the shout out to um, Gabrielle Lyon, Dr. Lyon. She's a physician in New York uh, and she calls it the, the organ of longevity. I think she coined that term. I'm not totally sure, but skeletal that. muscle really, um, gets a real short end of the stick. People just think about it as, you know, kind of 
being pretty or they think about it in terms of when it gets hurt or when you have fibromyalgia, when you're in pain around it. Without under, understanding, it's actually the largest organ in the body. People always say skin, but it's really not. It's really skeletal muscle. That whole thing works together. And it is the controller of your metabolism. It is the control, it's the gatekeeper of all your hormones and how that goes into your brain and how everything gets metabolized. Um, it's and it's pretty much we all need to think about it like you know gold or platinum as far as aging as the muscle goes you age faster you have a lot of muscle you don't really age I hate to tell you i mean age is a lot of cultural mindset it, it, that's a huge part of it it's not really as as much determined as people think it is it's a very cultural thing uh, and i'm interviewing somebody tomorrow to talk about that but um the muscle like you 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 muscular people, like you will never find somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia that's ripped and muscular. Mm. They don't. They don't exist. So then I have hope. I'm. Yeah. I'm I'll be fifty eight. I'm fifty seven. Okay. And one of the things that I've always been very focused on was making sure um, that I did the things, whether it was eating or you know hiking or walking or or mm -hmm. overloading my muscles or whatever always made sure that I was like a head skeletal muscle. Yeah, it's huge. Women don't get trained as much. I was one of the rare people. I was just talking to my friend about this. So um, I'm close to 50. And so when I started lifting weights, I was in college and it was very unusual to, for a woman to lift weights. And we were just talking about this. Like I was the only woman in my college um, weight room and all the guys I was with the football team everybody, and they loved it they loved that I was in there and then women started coming to me saying when they're all doing their treadmill their little stairmaster that was the big thing stairmaster um for hours and I was like oh I don't have time for that I like to just get it done hit it hard and get it done right? <laughs> run how fast can I run a mile and we quit it and just lift some weights throw heavy things around I prefer that right mm -hmm. so and and the men they would say well I'm so intimidated. Can I go? In so I started personal training all these women in college. I wasn't a, per I had no certificate, but I was like, I had a book and I was learning how to do it. And the guys all told me, my professors, we all lift. It was amazing. And I love it. what can happen to your body so quickly. But women, there's a lot of myths about, about weight training and muscle and cardio. Like I don't, I am and not a fan of cardio in any way, shape or form, other than if you're playing a game, I play college basketball and college soccer. Like it, I love sports. I love that. Those are those are all sprint work. You know, most of these things are really like hit training, where it's a lot of explosive work and, and weight training, and it's a very different physiology. Lifting weights is to me lifting heavy things. I like to say that because I don't care if you're throwing logs or on your backyard. I don't think you have to join a gym. I think you need to do work. What people you need to do: dig some holes and plant some things and ch cut a, you know tree down. Uh, you're building muscle all the time in that. And that's the most important thing as we age is to be building muscle. And you do it, you know, muscle happens in three ways. Um, strong hormone signals. Well, when you're a kid, you got strong. I mean, you know, a 15, 16 year old boy can eat pizza and chips and they're going to build muscle, right? It's hormone signals. Well, as we age, those hormone signals change dramatically. And I do a lot in my courses with my patients around hormone optimization, hormone replacement, hormone mm -hmm. signaling. I try to get hormone levels back. I have hormone levels more like a 25 year old. And I'm, I intend Beautiful. to keep it that way because mm -hmm. I intend to keep it this way. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, I, I want to do things. I have a 14 year old son and I, I'm trying to keep up and I actually mm -hmm. need to start hitting it harder because I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to keep up soon as he hits full puberty and he's going to outpace me. And I want to be able to ride my bike and box with him and do these things that he's doing without being like, oh Lord, your mama's getting old. I don't want to say those words ever. I don't want that yes. to be some excuse, right? Yeah. So you have hormone signals, hormones being strong when you're young, and then we can use um, optimization, homeo homeopathy, and even replacement or peptides mm -hmm. to, to help with those signals to keep them mm -hmm. strong. Yeah. Um, diet. So you need, um, a bolus amount of protein, 30 to 50 grams of whole complete protein. You're not going to get that from broccoli and beans. You need animal meat. You're going to need a whole lot more if you're trying to do it vegetarian, but you need that signal to create muscle building. And so that creates a hormone signal as if you lifted weights. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the heavy weight. There's explosive 
hard work where you're doing something that's hard on the body. It's like, wow, what the hell did you just do? That hurt. Yeah. And then you sleep. You have to sleep so you that sleep you can and rejuvenate it holds itself to repair. And it says, what if she does that again tomorrow? We should probably make it stronger so that doesn't feel that bad. That's what the muscles do. are like talking. I, I, I yes. personify every part of my body. It makes it so much better. So I talk to it. I talk to my, my muscles. I visualize my muscles. I was in my sauna this morning and that's what I do. I see myself and talk to myself as that was like me lifting weights. Yeah, and I can yeah. Lift weights, right? But it's true. It's hundred percent. You're yeah. overloading the muscle. Yeah. You do you need to regenerate that. Yeah. that sleep and repairing the muscle. Yep. Um, I just happen to have a lot of patients, and I went through it myself with mold, um, biotoxin illness. So I have a lot of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Lyme, mold patients wow. that they they can't just work out. They, I can't just say, hey, well, let's get you back on. I mean, it's a really bad situation and their level of pain and fatigue is so severe. Yes. That I have to use food. So meat signaling, mTOR signaling with that and um, supplements and hormones. It, it's, my, it's my first avenue, sometimes for six months to a year before I can get them back into physical activity, right? And then their physical activity still has to be tempered a little bit different as we're healing, right? Of course. So it's very, very different than talking to a, a fit 25-year-old if I'm dealing with a 68-year-old fibromyalgia patient, right? Yeah. Who's avoided the gym now for 20 years or 30 mm -hmm. years. Yeah, and understandably so. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I definitely get that being in, you know, gym But I have to build that stuff. muscle. That's a critical thing. Got to build I that muscle. Them, I help them get results until they're ready and then they'll feel it. You, when you start to get there, I just thought, once I was like, just, just wait. I said, when you want to start throwing stuff around, that's when you're ready. <laughs> you that's know? when you're ready. It's you'll true. know. You'll, you'll you're know. Ready. You yeah. mentioned two things that, that I'm just highlighting now in my brain is uh, one of them about the, the hormones and the growth hormone, because one of the things about the skeletal muscle being a, such a huge deal, that was one of the reasons why I actually uh, started using the HGH gel mm -hmm. and even becoming a distributor. And, um, and, and then you talked about... Um, amino acids. And it was one of the questions that I wanted to make sure I asked you, uh, uh, what, isn't it the amino acids that we get just from protein from animals? Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it needs to be, yes. I talked about a whole protein or an incomplete protein. So if it yeah. doesn't have all the amino acid, yeah. yeah. Because I feel that personally, like I, I've had uh, a history of studying food for a long time and, yeah. you know, and even our emotional behavior toward food and as a professional, yeah. like a ballerina and a dancer. And then I was in the gym business. I have seen I have seen every diet and every trend yeah. under the sun come and go. I've even yeah. tried several of them, right? I mean, yeah. uh, some of them have gone and come back with a different name. Please, yeah. I, I, yeah. I can't even tell you, but you know. So yeah. um, I, mean, I was even a vegan once upon a time. Yeah. But today, today, what I firmly know is that you need those amino, I think it's acids or peptides. Amino acids, like, yep. They're the you need the amino acids that you can only get from an animal. Sorry, yeah. vegans. And I'm not vegan bashing. I'm just feeling that for optimum, optimal health, you need that to grow Absolutely. those muscles the way you need. So they're right, called right. essential. So they're called essential amino acids. So you got it like when it comes to the macronutrients, which we would call protein, fat, and carbohydrates, uh -huh. we have some proteins, they're little, they're little like Legos. We would, so you put a bunch of Legos together. Each Lego is an amino acid. You put a bunch of those together. It makes a peptide, put even more and it's called a protein. So that's what that is. Some of those are essential and some are non-essential. Non-essential means we can make them. But some are essential, meaning our body cannot make them. If you do not eat them, you will not have them. So then if you don't eat them, you are, will never be able to make all the proper peptides and other subproteins that need to be made because you're missing. You have to substitute and figure things out because they're essential. Fats are the same way. We have some essential fatty acids and some that are not essential. We can make most of them, but there are certain essential fatty acids, again, only present in animals essential only present in there. Now you can take carbohydrates. That's a whole other thing. None of those are essential, by the way. There's not a single carbo, any, there's no subcomponent. So the only things we have to eat are fat and protein, by the way. So just from that point, then, you know, if you, I was a vegan for 12 years. You were too. Okay. Interesting. 
Yeah, 14 years vegetarian, 12 years vegan. And so most of my recovery is still probably dealing from what that did to my body for such a long time. Yeah. Um, but I'll t- give you an example. I just wrote a chapter for a book about longevity. Um, I'm in a compilation book with the world experts in longevity and about aging well, about age rejuvenation and j- aging well. And um, in all that research, and I'm in, uh, uh, it's part of one of the things I specialize in with epigenetics and looking at how to unlock the codes into being 150. You know, we're all looking all at this now, right? In all the different ways and how to combine primal living, ancient ways of eating with all these amazing different substances and chemicals and devices, right? It's, a, it's an interesting balance of what's about to happen in the world and how we blend these things to, to stay human. And what is that going to mean? What is the human 2.0 going to be? I don't know necessarily, right? Um, all that to say, there's there's a unique, um, in, in the longevity world, centenarians are people that live under over 100. So when you study centenarians and People have done this. I'm interviewing one of them tomorrow, one of the experts. There is not a single vegan that's centenarian. Yeah. They don't live over 100. It's a complete myth that vegans live longer. They don't. It's absolutely not true. And none are over 100. And there's no indigenous culture ever on earth that's been vegan. There's no second generation, we don't have any of these cult- second and third generations, you can't replicate. So it's unfortunate. I get the movement. I get it. I get where they're coming yeah. from. Yeah. Um, but-, but the reality is my job is to study physiology. My jo- job is to study the human system. My job is to look at what have humans done for hundreds of thousands of years? How did we get to be who we are today? Where did we come from? How did we get here? How are we optimized in the past? And how are we going to be optimized today and in the future? And without a doubt, I, animal protein is king. Yeah. So, Thank you for, for underscoring that. I, I appreciate that. For, I mean, there's you know, nothing. The, and the mental health comparisons, there's no comparison. Oh, Everything clearly shows to get mental. I will. I actually a few years ago decided I will not take vegans into my practice any longer, unless they're willing to change. Because they're asking me to change the structure and function of their brains from a pathological state and rebuild it. I don't have the substrate. I can't. Your brain is an animal. Your animal. I'm an animal. I am animal protein and animal fat. That's a hundred and minerals. That's what I am. Yes. There's only 2,000 calories of carbohydrates called glycogen. I am almost all protein and fat, animal protein and animal fat. It's, and my brain is 70% fat, saturated fat and cholesterol. You only get that from being an animal and eating animals. So it's really easy to turn this into that from a steak. Do you know how hard it is to make this from broccoli? <laughs> I, I don't think you can. <laughs> it's obscene. The amount of chemical reactions, the amount of enzymatic reactions, and with every in, in digestive enzymes, and with every moment, every m- passing month, and age, and uh, year of age, as well as stress levels, your digestive enzymes are lower. Your enzymes all over the body are lower. Your pro- I mean, it's 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 really asking a lot. And if you have to have a book with you know, humans are the only animals on earth that need fourteen books to know how to eat. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. I mean, really, the lions sit around on the on the plains and they're like, these people are so stupid. I mean, they're 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 thinking the bill is like somebody trying to kill them. They act like they need, you know, if you need an app to know how to eat, you really need to take my class because I can't understand it. Seriously. You don't need food combinations and metrics and tracking and then I'm like, if you're I, but that's what people are doing now. They've, you know turned, they've turned a basic biological process into 18,000 books. And I'm like, I know. It isn't and, rocket and, science, actually. Yeah. Everyone's looking for this also, not just a quick fix, but this secret. But yeah. I, I honestly, you know, just to really underscore what you're saying is I, I really feel like it's innate. Yeah. It is if no, you allow you know, it. You get really no, exactly. Perverted. We do and we don't. I mean, to be really clear, like okay. children, everybody knows until we pervert them. So that baby right. knows what it likes. So you you take a nine-month-old 
I had a baby, you had a baby, you put mm-hmm. them in a high chair, you give them broccoli, they all spit it out. They all hate it. Mm-hmm. You give them some bacon and they're all happy, mm-hmm. right? We train them to, to deny what their taste buds are telling them and eat things that they hate. Then we give them cake and frosting. And now we've taken a, a palate that thinks a strawberry is one of the sweetest things it's ever tasted. Like it's an explosion of sugar in its mouth. And now you give it a, a, a cake from Publix. Yeah. You've yeah. destroyed the palate. Now that strawberry is perverse to it and it needs Oreos and, and ice cream and cookies and candy because now Rice isn't even sweet, which by the way, if you let rice dissolve in your mouth, it should taste sweet. Absolutely. It's sugar. Yeah. But see, if you've perverted your taste buds, just like we perverted our senses with constant onslaught of television and shows and media and blah, 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 blah. Yes. How is anybody supposed to ever connect to themselves? They're so disconnected from. Oh. Dieting is 80%. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I need to I so So, agree. Wow, wow, wow. People, they're, so yes, I believe in, I want people to be connected to their intuition and their innate intelligence again. If they were connected. They're all jacked up. We have to remove a bunch of garbage and bad scripts and trauma and, Mm -hmm. and poison. I mean, if they're walking into my, you know, if you're walking into my office drinking a chemical concoction of like Mm -hmm. bright blue sugar, high fructose corn syrup, artificial, whatever drink. Mm -hmm. And what? Like I'm supposed to trust. Well, I just trust, you know, I was craving chocolate. So does that mean I need magnesium? No, pumpkin. It means you're a sugar addict and we need to go through withdrawal. No, (laughs) it's so (laughs) it's so true. Oh my goodness. But if you want to keep justifying it, knock yourself out because you Googled that it means you're low in magnesium. No, Mm. honey, that's not it. (laughs) You remind me of me. That's too funny. Stephanie, I want to, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know, yeah. You people are like, So, so thank you for supporting me and my podcast. Um, How may I support you? What are you working on these days? And I love that you're writing, you're collaborating on this book which sounds amazing. Yeah, that'll be out in November. We have a summit. I'm going to tell you my battery's about to die. Okay, so So how can my listeners support you? I'm drrimka.com. And I have uh, on there, you can learn about my courses. I offer online courses. I'm really pushing those hard right now. They're really awesome. And it's a great value. I offer retreats. It was a horrible time to start running retreats with COVID, but we will be doing the first one next year. It's a South African safari. Um, And you can learn about those. We have a a couple other ones that are in the works, but that'll be the first one I do next year. Um, And I have a lot of products that I support ranging from blue light blocking glasses and red light panels and various supplement stores. Um, And there's one-on-one care. I have a very long wait list right now. So getting in with into me is kind of rough. You're probably not going to get in, but if you get in my courses, I do a little bit of consults for them privately, but I have a long wait list right now for uh, private care. But yeah, drrimka.com will take you to everything you need to know. We're trying to keep everything in one place and um, great. You yeah. heard it here. Oh, yeah, courses and, and, and my products would be awesome because seeing patients is, is a little bit different under these circumstances and we've all had to change things up a little bit. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.